In this discussion, I talked with Kate from What the Wreck. We shared about living well, aging well, and dying well. These are topics that we incorporated recreation into and further dissected. Additionally, we talked about volunteering and how beneficial volunteering can be, not only for the volunteer, but also for the individual gaining that support. And she shared many insightful things, so please tune in and follow along. So hello and welcome. It's so nice to meet and finally get in touch with you. I'm so excited to hear a little bit about you. So here today, I'm joined with Kate from What the Wreck. And Kate, I'd really love for you just to tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, yes, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. My name is Kate. I, as you said, I run the site What the Wreck. It is a resource website uh, geared towards recreation professionals, um, mainly in aging services, but I try to provide other tips and tricks, whether that be for management or volunteer management, all those different kinds of outside aspects that all kind of overlap. I live in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and currently I am the director of volunteer and internship services at a hospice organization in the area. Um, so I am in charge of uh, recruiting, onboarding, retaining volunteers, and uh, making sure that our volunteers out in the field have kind of the best education and um, understanding of geriatrics and end of life care possible. But that's currently my role right now. That's awesome. Yeah, I'd love to hear um, how that role has really changed since COVID because I know for lots of facilities, um, even internships, but also definitely volunteers have been really impacted by this. Yeah, of course. Um, it definitely has been an interesting job to say the least during this time. So COVID or when COVID, you know, hit, I was actually um, a director of an adult day center uh, for uh, the geriatric population and that got shut down. So I kind of had a little bit of time to figure out what my next move was, um, where my where my strengths um, lied and I kind of settled upon, I liked the management aspect. I obviously liked advocating for recreation and leisure um, and all aspects of life. Um, and I like doing like large scale events those kinds of things. Um, and I realized that pretty much all of those things tie into volunteer management. Uh, so that's when I accepted a position at a five county wide hospice organization in Pennsylvania. Um, and that was in August of 2020. So that was definitely still when everything was full shut down, at least in Pennsylvania. Um, as far as healthcare was concerned. Um, so my job, even right now, is still much different than it would look typically. Mm -hmm. um, so I do a lot of virtual trainings, obviously. Um, and as of right now, we're still kind of waiting for the go ahead for volunteers to go back into facilities and people's homes. Um, because we're just unsure of like state regulations right now on if we're allowed to ask people if they have the vaccine and all, all sorts of, of, you know, red tape that we're like trying to figure out what the best policy and protocol is. Um, so that's been an interesting thing to try to navigate is like the politics of like this whole thing that like, you know, shouldn't be political. And we're trying to figure out, okay, if we send out a survey asking our volunteers, like, if they're vaccinated, will they understand like, you know, that whole thing? Mm -hmm. um, so we're we're kind of getting through that. So hopefully by the time, uh, within the next month, I think we'll have a better understanding of where we are in that. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of my job has just been virtual trainings. I do um, monthly kind of uh, lunch and learn events where I teach about different types of uh, dementia, dementia communication, um, things of that nature, which is a really great part of my job that I also love to do as well. Yeah, that's so awesome. Yeah, I think if 
uh, COVID has taught us one thing, it's like how adaptable we have to be and has made us very adaptable. And I think, yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, I think education is so huge and I really appreciate and um, am gaining more of an insight into that volunteer management role. And I think, you know, in any kind of management role, education is so important. So that's awesome. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I think also COVID's taught us to reflect and like has given us some time to reflect. So that's awesome that allowed you to, you know, change gears and uh, find something that's still really meaningful to you. Yeah, yeah, I definitely, it was, I'm not going to say that, you know, whatever you want to say about last year, but I was very thankful that I had that time without um, constantly doing something where I could say, okay, what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? Um, what do I actually want out of a new job? What don't I? Um, so that was the one, the one, uh, you know, diamond in a giant, giant, giant pit of uh, coal, basically. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's so awesome. I think it's so important to like, do that reflection and recognize like what strengths we have and um, being able to recognize our like value and worth to the team as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So speaking of meaning, I'm really curious to hear what does meaningful recreation and leisure look like to you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so really recreation, meaningful recreation and leisure means to me is just making sure that I'm doing something, even just like a little thing every day that doesn't have anything to do with work. It has nothing to do with my response, you know, quote unquote responsibilities of upkeeping a home, um, those kinds of things. So making sure that I carve out time every day to do something that is like meaningful to me, whether it's go for a walk and listen to an audio book or, um, you know, make sure that I sign up for a painting class next month, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and just kind of cultivating those interests and also trying new stuff. Um, I definitely think meaningful recreation for me is just making sure that I am like try always kind of trying new things and trying to kind of get the the, the best of each like recreation opportunity available to me um, because it is like a, pri a privileged space to be able to go out and have the time and have the resources to do those things. Um, whether it, you know, just be walking in my local park or, you know, whatever it may be. Um, so just kind of being in the moment as well is uh, important to me. Yeah. Those are all beautiful and really important nuggets. I think, you know, having those little things every day allow us to refill what I like to call our like wellness tank or our bucket and ensure that we can provide that best care. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate that. Yeah, I definitely agree. Like making sure that when you're, you are doing, even if just something small, like for five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever you have throughout your day. And just like, like you said, filling that, that cup up because if you don't, then especially as like healthcare professionals, we're not going to be doing the things to our best abilities in our jobs um, because we're not kind of focusing on what our own, you know, leisure and own internal wellness is. So it's definitely important. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I agree. Um, so to jump into the topic city, um, a few different topics come up because as many recreation professionals, you are a multi-passionate person, which is obviously one of your strengths. Um, so with that right now, I know you're completing your, or you're working towards your master's in gerontology. Um, so that's one of your passions and you really love talking about aging well with recreation and leisure, as well as that importance of the volunteer management role. Um, so to dive in, I'd really love for you just to define and explain what aging well looks like. Yeah. Um, so my concept of aging well is obviously it varies and is different for every single person. Um, but as a whole, aging well means that you are free of 
specific barriers, whether that be community barriers, home barriers, um, and you are living your best life in every stage of life. So whether that is in your early 50s, whether that's in your 70s, whether that's in your, you know, hundreds, um, all of those stages are, of life are going to look different. Um, but that doesn't mean that the person that's 100 years old isn't living their life to their best ability. So making sure that people that are aging are doing so with the resources they need to reach their the best potential possible. Um, and again, whether that's sometimes 100 years old still is going and you know there's no end in sight. Sometimes they're 100 years old and they're in the end stages of life and you still have a, the opportunity and the like the, the dignity of life basically to live, live that portion of your life, whether it's three months, three days, three minutes um, in the best possible way. Um, and I think that kind of aging well plays into the whole dying well process as well is how as recreation and healthcare professionals in aging services, how can we aid in aging well, living well and dying well? Um, and I think they're all kind of like interconnected. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of putting you on the spot, but could you compare uh, living well, aging well and dying well? Um, I think this is a really interesting topic and I think it'd be interesting to compare. Yeah, so aging well in my perspective is you have long-term goals still. So you are aging and you have specific goals. You want to be, you want to stay in your community or you want to have, um, you know, uh, whatever it may be, whatever your long-term goals are, whether it's months, you know, years, et cetera. You have specific goals that you feel you can still obtain and other people in your resource pool are helping you achieve them. So that's aging well. Um, you know, you still go to bocce ball on Wednesdays. You, um, you know, you call your granddaughter on Friday, like whatever it may be that's in your wheelhouse. Those are the things that you need to feel good and live your life to the best of your own personal being. Um, so living well, basically, you know, just encompasses that whole thing. So you're, you're aging, but a lot of the times I feel like in our society, we see aging as, oh, they're gonna, they're dying. Like they're old now. Like it, don't even worry about them. Like they've lived their life. It's kind of, they'll, they'll figure it out. Um, X, Y, Z. So making sure that people are, again, living their fullest life, whether it be in their, in the next 10 years or the next 10 minutes. Um, so that's kind of where the dying well comes into play as well, because uh, I especially like to tell um, the people that I am, you know, educating um, in my, my work, um, is that like, just because you're dying doesn't mean you're not still living, you're still alive. So what are the things in your life in that moment uh, that are going to make you feel at ease, are going to make you feel comfortable? Um, because the goals, like, you know, every recreation and healthcare professional has goals, right, for people. Um, the goal for somebody aging well is going to be a long-term goal. The goal for somebody dying well is going to be an immediate goal um, and a daily goal. So, you know, they're going to feel comfort and at peace by utilizing X, Y, Z, or a volunteer is going to go and visit them to provide, you know, hand massages and, um, you know, comfort, you know, those kinds of things. Um, if that's something that brings that person peace and solace and uh, a space to, again, die well. Um, because there's a lots of, it, lots of instances where people don't 
don't die well. Um, and it's definitely a kind of privileged space and uh, something that I think recreation professionals should should and could really lean into mm -hmm. as um, a completely uh, not even separate field, but on top of a lot of you know recreation professionals working in geriatrics, um, you know the whole concept of making sure that you're providing leisure resources in every single stage and knowing that the aging stage where we say, oh, people over the age of 65, like, what are we gonna do for them? The person that's 65 and still active is just as important as the person that's, you know, 83 and, you know, in on hospice, on a hospice bed. Their leisure in, importance and their leisure interests um, are, equally as valid and equally as important. Um, so I think that that's kind of like a really interesting and specific space that we could really lean into um, as a profession. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really beautifully said. And I think it's something that um, may get a blind eye for some and not even realize it of, I think we all have this mutual agreement that everyone deserves and it's a human right to have recreation and leisure when people unfortunately are in those later stages sometimes it's almost as if like oh i don't want to upset them or annoy them but you know as that therapeutic relationship that we do have with that individual it's so important to continue that and i agree that it is something that is very important to recognize and shape into our field and I can see the interconnections of really just for that person, for that time in their lives, just doing what makes them feel well, which is very individualized, just like recreation and leisure. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And uh, especially with the concept of, you know, having leisure and recreation and the concept of death and dying, um, it gives us an opportunity to kind of reevaluate honestly, like, you know, human experience, like the things that you liked when you were, you know, 25, say, or the things that you still enjoyed at 25 and at 75 are still going to be the things that bring you joy when you're 95. So if you love cats, guess what? You're going to want to have a cat with you in those last few days. Um, if you love the smell of lavender your whole life, that's going to be the scent that brings you comfort. Pretty much every single thing that brings people joy, even in, uh, in especially in, in their kind of last days or, you know, last few months, all involve some form of recreation or leisure pursuit. They're not going to be like, oh, I miss, you know, working my 40 hour a week job. Um, can you please bring me a laptop? Like, <laughs> For sure. Um, I guess to take on to that, I think, you know, involving the family must be so important during that time as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, a lot of what my job is and our social workers on our team is making sure that uh, our families are very much involved in um, the educational aspect of all sorts of things. So all my whole hospice organization is uh like certified in hand massage, massage therapy um and so we teach that to our families um because sometimes a lot of the time families have a hard time uh verbally communicating with their loved ones because they don't know what to say mm -hmm. um but instead of just sitting there um one thing that we have realized is you know the power of touch Mm -hmm. um and showcasing and teaching families how to kind of just the importance of sitting in silence and also um that kind of therapeutic touch is very 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 powerful yeah that's awesome yeah I think educating both the staff and the family and giving that support for both sides is so important so um I'm sure they really appreciate you and all you do do um so we kind of started talking about this, but I'd love to dig a little bit deeper on really how leisure 
influences and impacts our quality of life? Yeah. Um, so obviously, like I said, leisure impacts, you know, you at all stages, right? So the things that maybe you're interested in, at, you know, I'm almost 30. So the things that I'm interested in now might not be the things that I'm interested in when I'm 60. Um, but the core things will still be there. Um, so kind of understanding and grasping on to those kind of key elements of yourself are always all connected, all like kind of trying to know yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So your leisure habits and your leisure interests are always going to be tied to your personality, who you are as a person, again, what you find interesting. Um, and those are just all kind of important in figuring out who you are because recreation is and leisure are, in my opinion, much more, a much better gauge of what a person likes and what a per, how a person is um, then, you know, maybe, maybe their job or maybe it ties in. I feel like recreation people, it kind of ties in. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think it, I think kind of just understanding who, who you are and trying all these different recreation activities kind of all eventually ties into, you know, who you are as a person. And as you age, um, that kind of ties into the whole aging well concept. Cause if you kind of know who you are, you know, the recreation pursuits that you enjoy um, that can really help you in that aging well process. Um, and I think that's, that's something that a lot of uh, the older generations didn't have that we now have. Um, that will be interesting to kind of see. I always think about what, what will, uh, aging services look like like when when I'm you know 65 or 70 uh so yeah just I guess understanding who you are and uh growing as a person and making sure that you kind of understand your leisure interests can help shape shape you as a person that's really awesome yeah I can think about for myself I love anything outdoors and adventurous so when I'm older, it may be adapted. I may not be able to go for like a 10 kilometer intensive hike, but maybe I can go for a walk on like, maybe I'm in a wheelchair and I can go on an accessible walk. Um, so just knowing that foundationally for me, nature is really important to me. That's something that's going to yeah. go on for the rest of my life. So I definitely see that and how there may be activities specific that may change, but you know, at the core of me, I know that that's important. That's awesome. Yeah. To shift the conversation just slightly, I'd love to talk about what dimensions of wellness we should focus on and how they may shift or vary over the lifespan. Yeah, okay. Um, so obviously as a geriatric professional, um, especially in long-term care, I focus on the eight domains of wellness as a whole. So I like um, when you work in long-term care, at least in the, in the United States, um, you have to include all uh, wellness domains in your calendar. Um, so I personally think that every domain is just as important and just as valid as all the others. Mm -hmm. um, though for each person, certain domains might mean more to them than others. Mm -hmm. So for example, there might be people, um, especially older adults, who their career really was their main drive and their main focus and the one thing that they valued the most. You know, they were a banker, they were a secretary, etc. And the things that they like to do are still that still revolve around feeling helpful, feeling. Uh, like they are providing a service um, in doing those kinds of things. So kind of knowing what each person, individual person um, values within that wellness domain wheel house um, definitely helps recreation professionals uh, kind of gear where, where they need to go. Um, yeah, I completely agree. And I think an add-on question to that is, 
for someone maybe working with an individual for the first time, what is a good way to kind of gauge which wellness domains may be interesting or really important to them? Yeah, um, so a good thing, I know that there's like specific assessments uh, that people can obviously pull from, um, but one of the main things that I did, which wasn't really an assessment, um, you know, from that big red book that we all have, um, was kind of giving them examples of, would you rather do this or would you rather do this? So would you rather paint a picture or would you rather go for a walk on the beach? Um, and I try to make it so they can't say either or because I'll ask the same questions uh, versus other questions later. So if they constantly, you know, at the end of the quiz are saying that they much rather like um, creative pursuits, then you know that the creative wellness domain is their most important domain. And you always add like different questions. Um, and especially like in, in uh, long-term care or um, uh, adult day, things like that. Um, you always wanna ask questions about things that you already do and things that you are thinking about doing. Mm -hmm. um, so then it kind of gives you an, a better gauge or a better step into how to best program plan for that specific person. Mm -hmm. um, because then you'll know what they're already interested in. So if you have this whole this or that sheet and they say they never, ever, ever on that whole sheet say that they like gardening, um, then, you know, uh, environmental on their wheelhouse might not be, you know, their most, most important thing. Obviously, you're still going to invite them out to you know, your gardening programs and provide those other um, environmental wellness things. Um, but it's not going to be in your brain that, you know, Mrs. Brown is really acting strange or not wanting to participate or whatever it may be, because, you know, she hates the garden. She hates weeds. She hates being outside in the bugs. That would, that would be me. I'd be like, don't, don't ask me to do that. I don't have a green thumb. Um, so I think that's something that a lot of recreation, especially geriatric professionals need to kind of understand is where in the wheelhouse that people, like what are their top three? What are their top three things that they find the most joy in? Um, because I, I think a lot of the times in, in long-term care, we get so pressured and so, um, pushed into how many people we can get to join a program. Well, if, if you know you get 20 people to join your program, but only three of them actually wanted to be there or like actually find the topic or whatever um, of value to them, then that program is only valuable to three people. So what, what is, what's the measure then um, of success? If the measure of success is how many people cool, I guess you've reached your goal, but if the measure of success is, has this impacted somebody in a positive way um, for that day, then probably not. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love the this or that because I think someone with, you know, uh, you know, decreased cognitive ability can also do that. And having that option. I remember having like a conversation ball and I had to switch it into like a this or that conversation ball and adapt yeah. that because um, for some individuals having too many options or too open of a question um, is gonna be really overwhelming. So I think that's great. Yes, that's, um, I'm actually, I'm a kind of off topic, but kind of same topic. Um, I'm actually a certified dementia trainer. Um, and that is one thing that uh, I teach or that is like kind of important for people in uh, aging services, especially, you know, dementia care or memory care, etc. is making sure that you are asking either or questions um, and never saying, you know, would you like, you know, would you like a glass of milk? Um, then they're just going to say no. 
But if you say, would you rather have juice, apple juice or orange juice? And you don't give them any other options or an option to say no, they're going to say one or the other. Mm -hmm. So that kind of, again, ties into the recreation kind of quote unquote assessment. It's not a real assessment. I kind of just made it up. But, um, you know, would do you like checkers or do you like cards? Um, and if they say cards, then okay, cool. But then you can also take that, you know, that checkers piece and pit it against something else because maybe they just like board games slash card games. So if you pit checkers against, I don't know, uh, a cookout, you know, just a community cookout and they say checkers and it's like, okay, you like one-on-one -on -one individualized activity time, not large group programs. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And I think it's like a less um, overwhelming experience instead of like a formal assessment. So that's awesome. And I think, you know, from personal experience, my grandmother has dementia and it's been really interesting after taking um, a course in dementia and learning about that, how much more rich conversations I can have without, you know, having to tie specific memories or like ask super open-ended questions and instead, you know, have a topic that we talk about and tailoring questions just a little bit differently. And I think that's such mm -hmm. an important thing to teach everyone for sure. Because I think everyone yeah. knows someone who has dementia or someone who has some kind of cognitive impairment. Yeah, that is, that's very, very true. Um, and yeah, so I think I think the the stigma and the fear behind a lot of the times working with people, especially just elderly in general, mm -hmm. um, is that you're not going to know what to talk about. You're not going to know how to talk to them, and you know they might have some sort of brain change that you don't know how to deal with. Um, and just having those kind of resources available to you um for how to have better communication is is really key um I think that you know before anyone goes into older adult care in any capacity should outside even outside of the workplace look look into um dementia training etc brain change um programs and classes um because you can never learn enough. You can never uh, have, you can never know all of it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all also very useful. Yeah, I agree. I also think that everyone who has the opportunity, I know for our school, we did like a virtual dementia tour and that was so amazing and just like gaining insight and further empathizing with what they're going through and being able to, you know, create strategies around that after experiencing that. Yeah, for sure. Um, so jumping on another topic that's a little bit different again, because <laughs> apparently All right. I was a little scattered when I was creating these questions, but that's okay. Um, but I'm really wondering, um, I know for thinking about death and dying, there's lots of grief to come with it as well. So I'm wondering um, if you have any tips or tricks on how we can utilize recreation and leisure to overcome grief. Or yeah. go through grief because I know it's something that is kind of always there when we lose someone. Yep. Um perfect, perfectly put. Um, I don't think we ever actually get over grief. It is just something that we create a big old bigger vessel for. Um so and then you know we can we can put more grief in the grief backpack as our lives go on. Um so I definitely think that. Uh, people that work in healthcare in general have a um, opportunity and a kind of need to do this for themselves. Um, if you're going to be in recreation, long term, or recreation, healthcare, human services, etc., um, long term is to you know sit with your grief um, and sit with sadness. Um, because it's not normal for, you know, us to, especially over this past year, um, deal with death constantly on a constant ongoing basis. 
Um, it's not normal and it is um, unsettling really to uh, think that we can do that. Um, so I think a lot of the times, uh, especially recreation professionals, have to kind of dig into that well of how, what, what leisure resources do they find joy in um, that can relieve them of some, some stress or some, um, grief of some kind. Um, again, I don't think that there's any one thing that all people can do because what, you know, what brings me, uh, relief, um, isn't going to bring somebody else relief. Mm -hmm. Um, but I definitely think that as a culture, as a whole, as a profession, um, that, a really great thing is having uh, kind of like meet like meetings like um, you know if you have a workplace where you do work with aging clients and they keep dying um, you know having that space and that time to go somewhere go to the social workers office talk about it um, making sure that you go through those, that process of grief um, on your own time and in your own way uh, and making sure that you understand that those people, even though you were working there, um, that, you know, they were people and you cared about them um, and it's okay to be, be sad. Um, I think a lot of the times human services professionals try to say, well, this, this is my job. So I can't, I can't be sad because then I'm not going to be able to hold it together for all the rest of these people. Well, all those rest of those people probably feel sad too. Mm -hmm. And they don't know how to express it and they don't have anything to do. Um, so I think that's where recreation professionals in, in general have a really great opportunity and a big role to play in, in grief in their specific, um, places of work. Um, I think that being able to hold kind of um, vigils or services for people that passed away is a huge way to, um, for you yourself to overcome uh, that grief. Um, and also, you know, your residents or the people that you are serving. Um, but then as far as the recreation aspect, again, just finding those things that give you the space and the time to uh, work out your own feelings. Like if you're, if you're sad, if you're angry, um, you're going to go through all those five stages of five stages of grief and then back again. Um, so, you know, for me, it's going for a walk. Mm -hmm. um, that's pretty much my, my go-to thing is if I'm sad, if I'm stressed, uh, whatever it may be. I just go for a walk around the city. Um, maybe I pop in some music, maybe I don't. Um, so just knowing like, again, kind of what is going to bring you kind of some relief sometimes for people that's like working out, like running on the treadmill. Um, so for some people that's, you know, talking it out with a friend. Um, others, it's, you know, listening to the same album on repeat five times in a row. Um, none of those things are the wrong answer. It's just whatever, whatever brings you solace and comfort at that time. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think it's, it's so individualized. I know for our clients, one thing that we used to do was we would scrapbook and some of the photos that would come up, it would be individuals that were their friends that had passed or had moved away. So we'd yeah. end up like talking about it and having a little story. And for some people, that's that's not their thing. Maybe they like to participate in activity that they used to participate in. And kind of to follow up with this, I'm wondering how could we as recreation professionals um, really support that caregiver or family member in their time of grief with their family member passing? Yeah. Um, so as kind of the volunteer coordinator, one of the things that I'm in charge of is bereavement. Um, volunteers. Uh, so 
on top of regular patient volunteers, I onboard and train people that are specifically there uh, for bereavement services. Um, so they will be people that are following the families and the loved ones of hospice patients that have passed. Um, and they kind of hold space for them to have conversations or um, just vent or cry or whatever it may be, um, whether that's visiting them face to face or, um, uh, you know, just calling them up over the phone. Um, it's a very specific thing, especially in hospice care. We, we follow our bereaved families for 13 months after the loved one has passed, um, because that is technically, um, the grieving process is a little over a year is, uh, how, how kind of families cope with death and loss. Um, so being able to train people and have people on a team that, that is their goal is to help kind of the families after their loss is so beautiful to see um that that is somebody's you know passion in life um because you know it it takes a strong it, i mean it takes a strong person to work for hospice in general but to want to be with those families uh you know once a week once a month whatever it may be um after the fact um is is very very moving um and then just having, so again, part of my job is, you know, onboarding and training them. Um, and a big part of my training is, you know, leisure resources. So being able to provide, you know, them being able to meet with the families and say, hey, uh, I know that you have an interest in, you know, pottery. Um, here's a therapeutic pottery class on Wednesday nights. You might find it you know, healing, or you might find it interesting, um, being able to find those resources for families that, um, might otherwise be too grief stricken or too, um, in their own shell to seek out those kinds of resources, whether they be recreation based or mental health based, etc., um, is really important. Um, and I think kind of ties in the whole recreation and leisure aspect with, end of life care and kind of family care as well. It's really amazing. And it's great that your company has that support and has that extended time um, to volunteer and ensure their, you know, wellness and quality of life in amongst themselves. And on this topic, I really want to um, learn a little bit about how as members of our community, how and why should we become volunteers for older adults? Yeah, um, so I will always advocate for people to volunteer with uh, older adults. Um, I actually started volunteering uh, for this program called Adopt a Grandparent when I was in my undergrad career. Um, and that's kind of the whole reason I, well, I always loved older adults, but this is kind of the tipping point of realizing I wanted to work with them professionally. Um, I would get credit uh, for this class. And um, basically I would go to nursing homes once a week and play bingo or do crafts or whatever it may be um, and just hang out. And I was like, wow, this is the coolest job. Like I am about this. Um, and I did that for all four years of my undergrad career. Uh, and that kind of solidified that, um, you know, that's what I wanted to do. So I always kind of encourage undergrads, especially to seek out opportunities, um, in their own college communities that focus on the elderly, because there are more than likely, um, a lot of resources for you to, to choose from. Um, but in general, I think that a lot of the times people seek out volunteer opportunities because obviously they want to help people, um, but they're not sure how. Um, so one of the great things I personally think about older adults is most of them don't care how. They don't, they just want you to be there. Mm -hmm. um, and they're just like so thankful that you just want to like talk to them. Um, 
they have no expectations. They have no, uh, you know, they have no uh, desire to get one over on you or like whatever it may be. Um, they just really value that kind of community connection, um, which I think falls away a lot of the times when people get placed in uh, long-term care um, and assisted living facilities. Um, we kind of, you know, as a culture, forget about them. Oh, they're somewhere else um, or they're fine. You know, they're, they're somewhere else. Um, so making sure that as a person in your community, you're not forgetting about the, the older adults in, in that space. Um, most of the houses in your, in your community used to be somebody else's house in there, probably in a 600 bed facility down the street now. Mm -hmm. um, and they probably lived in that house for 50 years. So they probably have a crap ton of stories that they can share with you about your own neighborhood uh, that you would never know about. Um, so I definitely think that kind of volunteering with older adults kind of gives you a perspective of your own community and uh, makes it less scary to age. Because um, I think a lot of people, younger people find older adults either uh, frightening or scary or whatever. Um, and I definitely think it gives you a better perspective of what aging looks like, what aging could look like, um, and breaks down kind of stigmas between generations and all sorts of great things. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. And I think, you know, there's benefits to both, like the volunteer um, and then also the individual who's getting that support. So I'm wondering if you yep. want to share a little bit about you know, personally, what you've seen either in your personal life or profession, um, what are the benefits of volunteering both for the individual who's volunteering, but also the person receiving that service? Yeah, um, so obviously, for the person receiving the service, um, again, it gives them that, co that connection to their community that they might have been lacking. Um, it also provides them with an outside resource. Um, that isn't their family that they can have somebody to talk to. Um, because no matter how much you love your mom or no matter how much you love your dad, there is some point, there's there's going to be some point when you're you're done hearing that, you know, that story that they always tell. And you know, eventually you're gonna be like, wow, I wish mom was still here to tell me that story. But in the moment, you're done hearing it. So having somebody else be you be the person being able to share their stories with somebody else that isn't part of their family is huge um because who who the heck else are they talking to uh, most of the time um no nobody else uh so that's kind of a really great thing um and then for the the volunteer um it's, it's almost the same. So they get a sense of community in, in a different way that they might have never thought of before. Um, I have a lot of volunteers, a lot of uh, college volunteers that do our, do a internship program through us. Um, whether that be for social work, for nursing, for music therapy, all sorts of things. And then after their internship ends, they keep coming. They keep, they say, oh, can I just be a regular volunteer now? And I'm like, yeah, sure, um, stick around. And they wanna stick around because those people become their friends. So that whole age barrier thing um, that, you know, a, a, what's a 25 year old got in common with an 85 year old probably a lot actually um and they've seen things and they've done things and they've uh you know gotten into some arguments and you know had their hearts broken and whatever it may be uh and can give give people like you know a little bit of wisdom that maybe those kids are don't want to hear from their parents just yet <laughs> yeah yeah uh, I agree 
I think a, <laughs> a huge thing I always take away from every interaction with someone in that age bracket is, you know, those individuals, all of them have some wise words to tell. And regardless of what program I'm running, I'm always learning something new from at least one person each session. So it's really mm -hmm. awesome. And I think really pulling and giving them that space through volunteering is really great. Yeah, I, de I definitely think so too. Just having uh, just having that space to, again, like that intergenerational crossover of like, how cool is it that you can like teach your grandma how to make a TikTok video? Like, you know what I mean? Like just this whole like crossover of like, you could make, you could have a, like, you know, make a video of like your grandma, like, or, you know, somebody else, if you're visiting somebody and, you know, their family's okay with it like, you know, dancing to like a Andrew's sister song or like whatever it may be, showing them something that like literally didn't exist when they were your age. Like, that's so cool to me. Um, and more oftentimes than not, the kids that I get through all of my different programs, through all my different jobs that I've had, uh, most of them are like, oh, wow, like, that was awesome. They, you know, they're just like me basically, or, you know, they, they were, did this when they were in college too, or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's, that's the best kind of uh, feedback or whatever um, from volunteer services, I think is the friendships that form and the, the bonds uh, that are created. Yeah, yeah, that's really awesome. And I think, like you've already echoed and um, just to share it again of, you know, building that bridge between the intergenerations, because we can all teach each other lots of different things. And we all have lots of different common interests. I think recreation and leisure is great for this, because even if they aren't doing it today, maybe they enjoy fishing, and you guys can share both stories of a time you went fishing, and it can fill really both of your pockets at the same time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> For sure. Um, so Kate, just in closing, I really have loved this conversation and I'm wondering if you have any recommendations to share with anyone to continue their understanding of aging well with leisure and recreation as well as volunteering. Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll give myself a little plug. Um, <laughs> so if you are after you listen to this podcast, I guess, and you are interested in aging services um, and other topics related to aging services, whether that's um, recreation resources for aging professionals or dementia care, dementia communication, um, and all the things that kind of intertwine with that, um, you can follow me on uh, What the Rec on Instagram. And my website, which is whattherecofficial.com. Um, I will be hopefully coming out with soon some dementia care communication classes um, for CEU credits that I am very excited about. Um, and I would love to kind of speak with everybody online and see, uh, see what everybody has to say. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And speaking of that, um... How can everyone find you? You kind of already answered that, um, but what's the best way, I guess, to find you or connect with you? And other than that continued education unit, is there anything else you have in the works? Yeah, um, so the best way to contact me would be through my Instagram account, which is uh, what underscore the underscore rec. Um, you can always send me a message on there and I will definitely get back to you. Um, and also my email is whattherecofficial at gmail.com um, if you feel like getting a hold of me that way. Uh, as far as other things in the works, like I said, the CEU um, opportunities, um, I'm also creating some webinars um, that will be free of charge um, on different topics, um, some of which we discussed today, uh, recreation and end-of-life services, 
um, dementia care communications. Um, and I also have a CEU um, course available through Smart Hub CEUs. If you are interested in um, volunteer management and how to create a volunteer management program, um, I have a six hour or six clock hour CEU course available through them. Um, and hopefully I will just be working more on providing uh, information that you guys find useful in the aging sphere in the year to come. <laughs> That's really awesome. And I'm excited for those webinars. I am always like such a keener on learning more. And I feel like, you know, with that growth mindset and just in general, I always want to continue learning. And like you said previously, you can never learn enough. And um, as a peer said to me before, uh, regardless of if you've heard the topic before, depending on the facilitator, you could get something different out of it. So I think definitely reaching out to you and checking into those resources is a great um, suggestion. And uh, before we leave, Kate, do you have any final words or words of wisdom you wanna leave with us today? Oh, wow, um, words of wisdom. So basically, really, I just hope that by the end of this, everybody kind of has a special appreciation for, for aging. Um, obviously aging is across the lifespan. It does not just mean older adults. Aging is you, aging is me, um, and making sure that you are tuning in to all of your recreation resources and all of your leisure pursuits and doing all the things that you hope to do when you are in your older adult years. Um, keep doing them and hopefully, uh, you get to, you know, keep at it when, when you're older as well. Thank you so much, Kate. And I really appreciate you taking the time to share and I can really see the passion shining through and it's really been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure as well. I really appreciate it. <laughs>